It's really good to be with you this morning. It's good to be able to come together and rejoice in what Christ has done. Over the last few weeks for Lent, the 48 day, the 40 days coming up to uh, resurrection, uh, we've been reading through the book of Mark and looking at uh, the, the kind of the action story that Mark writes and reports about the life of Jesus. In the first eight chapters, it's just review. If you weren't here, you can read Mark Uh, but the first eight chapters really establish Jesus authority who he is and 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 then the next eight chapters only 16 reveal his mission what he's come to do and now we're here where the mission has been accomplished while on the cross he said it is finished And, and but let me remind you the work of salvation the work of forgiveness was finished on the cross but Jesus is not finished Because as long as we're living and breathing, the grace of God is for us and with us and even in us as we believe this gospel. So this morning, uh, as we've looked at these things, maybe this week you were able to participate in some Holy Week activities, maybe a Seder feast, maybe a Good Friday service. We had, uh, I don't know, 120 people here on or thereabouts on Friday night. Some of you guys were here and great. And we had a time just nailing sin to the cross. It was awesome. And, and just remembering what d- the death of Christ accomplished and how we are called to die. But today we celebrate life, abundant eternal life that Jesus and his resurrected body has come to bring and is even with us now. It, 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 it's that reality that we want to talk about from Scripture this morning. See, there were a lot of movements that happened, messianic movements before the, and even after Jesus' life and death. There were dozens of messianic movements in Israel. And in almost every case, the messianic leader was killed. And in most cases, by execution. And after the leader's death of that movement, these movements would collapse and everybody would just gather up their stuff and say, well, that's that, head home. And they were disappointed, I'm sure. Of all the movements, only one did not collapse after the leader's death. Not only did it not collapse, it exploded. And in the course of 300 years, it had spread. This good news had spread through the Roman Empire, which was really the known civilized world at the time. And out of all those messianic movements, what made the Christian faith different? What made it different? Was it just another good religion? Christians would say it's because of what happened after their leader of this movement was killed. So what did happen? What happened to cause explosive growth in Christianity after the founder's death? Well, I want to look through scripture and kind of see some of this. For the disciples... And we're reminded over and over again why we gather to encourage one another. Because as human beings, part of our frailty is selective amnesia or maybe not even selective amnesia. We just forget stuff. And we'll see this with the disciples. But for the disciples on that Easter Sunday, it was really good. Even though they weren't sure about it real early. They were sh- it was good because that Saturday had, in a sense, been so bad. The enemies of Christ were confident that they'd put an end and put down another messianic movement his work was now a total failure on on Saturday Christ was in the grave we remember the passion and the crucifixion on Friday but we don't hear much about Saturday his life was over his tongue had been silenced and those miracles were finished as far as everybody was concerned and on that Saturday the only recorded activity in scripture was by the Pharisees, the very enemies of Christ. They they were no longer concerned with Jesus, but now their concern was with the disciples. So let's look at chapter 27 of Matthew. Matthew 27, 62 and 264. And we read here this activity. It says in 62, uh, the next day, the one after preparation day. Now, preparation day is the day before the Sabbath. That was Friday. That's why it was really important that whoever they crucified was dead because if they're going to bury him, and that's another story, we'll go there. The next day after preparation day, the chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate. 
Sir, they said, we remember that while he, Jesus, was still alive, that deceiver said, after three days, I will rise again. This is interesting that the Pharisees remember this, but the disciples seem to have amnesia. Verse 64, so give the order, they're asking Pilate for an official order, give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he has been raised from the dead. And the last deception will be worse than the first. Saturday. Saturdays in our culture, great, right? Right? You know, you've seen the memes. I'm sure I've seen them. If I've seen them, some of you have seen them. Where, you know, they show the, you know, it's like this is me running out of the office on Friday at 5 o'clock. Because we consider the weekend starting Friday afternoon. Except those of you who work constantly around the clock six, seven days a week. But anyway, um, and yet in this calendar that they observed, Saturday's the last day of the week. And Sunday is the first day of a new week. So I want us to kind of see that. See, the Pharisees' only concern here is the pesky disciples. No, those pesky disciples, they, they were concerned they might steal his body, but no concern was even necessary because, you see, the disciples were in meltdown mode. They weren't anywhere close to thinking about the stuff that the Pharisees were thinking about. They had scattered to every available hiding place in Jerusalem because they were fearful of a cross that had their name on it. So, see Saturday. Metaphorically, Saturday had no courage. None of the disciples were thinking, hey, so what are you going to say when you see Jesus tomorrow? They weren't doing that. I wonder what Jesus would be wearing tomorrow when he shows up. They're not having these conversations. No one is thinking they would see Jesus on Sunday. So their Saturday was utter despair. You would think somebody would remember how many times Jesus promised he would come back on the third day. I mean, there's statements all over the place. Um, Mark um, 8 says, he began to teach them. Yeah, 8.31. Is that right? He began... It's messing with me because I've got my 931. I'm going to read it too. Anyway, um, he began to teach them that the Son of Man, when we remember this a couple weeks ago, must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. Jesus taught him. It was right after he said, who do people say that I am? And they answered, you know, well, some people say this, some people say this. Who do you say I am? And Peter says, hey, you are the Messiah. You are the king. And Jesus, in another account, says, hey, flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you. You That that was a a revelation that came from the Spirit of God. And, And immediately when that happens, the very next thing in Mark is, he begins to teach them about what's gonna happen. And if you remember back a few weeks ago, Right after Jesus says this, I must suffer, I must be rejected, I must be killed, and I will rise again on the third day. Peter, the guy who answers questions nobody asks, rebukes him. They use the word rebuke him. Oh, no, it'll never, because Peter had his agenda. And it didn't fit that Jesus would die, that that Jesus would win the battle through laying his life down. They just couldn't wrap their minds around it. So, <clears throat> it also says in uh, 9, 9, uh, 31, says the Son of Man uh, is being betrayed to the hands of men, and uh, they will kill him, and after he's killed, he will rise again on the third day. And I won't read in chapter 10 in Mark. He tells them over and over, these things will happen. And the only people remembering are the ones that are his enemies. Whoo. Nobody says, hey, let's see, he was killed yesterday, today is Saturday, tomorrow's Sunday, okay, one day, two day, you know, t- tomorrow's the third, hey, you fellas think we ought to get up early and go check out the tomb? Nobody's having this conversation. Nobody connects the dots. See, Saturday, for them metaphorically, has no hope, 
not only metaphorically, but, but when we think about it, we think about it that way. But for them, there was no hope. They had lost all their memory. No courage. No courage at all. And on Sunday, they came to the tomb to embalm him. Not to talk to him. Mark 16, 1 through 3, we read, when the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might go anoint Jesus' body. And, and, and then verse 2 says, very early on the first day of the week, first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on, they were on their way to the tomb. And they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? Even the women didn't remember. And women are sharper than the men are. And they're going for the wrong reason. But they're going. It doesn't seem like an Easter parade to me. There's no victory in the faces or the hearts of the followers of Jesus. It may have been Sunday morning, but they were stuck in the hopelessness of Saturday. you ever feel like your world let's just be application do you ever feel like your world is stuck on Saturday and I'm not talking about the sunny nice one yesterday I'm talking about a frame of mind the last day of the week the last day of a really bad week you ever feel like you get stuck there sometimes you ever feel like you just can't find anything good every day's a rainy day oh wait it's raining today your sky's always gray mentally are, are there no silver linings in the story and it always has an unhappy ending. There's just no more courage or no hope or no reason to be positive. You ever feel like your world is stuck on that kind of a Saturday? When you put your hope at some point in something or someone and then they let you down or even worse, they die. This is kind of, that's kind of a downer. That's a bad Saturday. And death seems like the ultimate insult. I mean, you do your best to make a difference. This is religion talking here. You do your best to make a difference and you try to do what's right and, and, and you try to stay healthy and eat right and exercise and follow the rules and, and, but nobody outlives death. I'm not saying you shouldn't use good sense. I'm saying this is the, the end is always death. Nobody leaves your alive. There are no um, U-Hauls behind a hearse. You're not taking stuff with you and so in the end, you die. I don't care who you are. I don't want to tell you that as a downer. I don't want to leave you on Saturday, so we're going to move on. There's just something about, about that which just sucks our lives into a Saturday state of mind if we stay there. You find yourself maybe at a funeral and it hits you. You can't outrun it. I stopped by, which is sort of part of my Sunday morning routine. I stopped by Starbucks this morning very early. And uh, there were some people in there that I know from the community, and everybody was older than me. That's fun. Every, I was the young person. That's funny. Never mind. First service got it. They were more awake. But, but, but I, I say that to say this. There's a fellow I know who, who's been a coach, and he's been retired for some time, and he asked me if I knew so-and-so. I said, I know that name. He said, he had an aneurysm, and he died just yesterday. And he said, he was only 70, he said he was only 70 years old. And quickly at that table, the, the, the discussion went to, I guess none of us know how long. You know, we need to enjoy every day. And I'm thinking, here's the reality. This is what we celebrate today. Death has been defeated. Wait a minute, I'm getting ahead of myself. We get stuck though. We get stuck there if that's the end. If the end is just the end of this husk, this container, this friend of mine who was a preacher always used to call this the carton. Your, your carton. Some look better than others. I don't know. Listen, I believe if you don't have an answer for the grave, you're stuck on Saturday your whole life. Whatever you got here. I mean... You may have your moments that are bright, but if you don't have an answer for the grave, let me tell you, you're stuck on Saturday. And that's why we love Resurrection Sunday. That's why we should love Easter 
Resurrection Sunday because to every single person, Easter, Resurrection Sunday, gives us this promise. Death is not a dead end. Death is not a dead end. It is simply an on-ramp from this life to your best life. Yeah. Two people believe that. So, the kingdom of God will spread because of two or three agree. It is not a dead end. And your best life is probably not now. But you can have a joyous life. You can have a fulfilled life. You can have a life with Jesus. But your best life is when you hit that on-ramp. When this carton is no longer here. With its loss of hair and bad knees and all that goes with it. Some of you that are younger, you're like, I'm invincible. I know, a couple of you ran some big races in the last couple of weeks. And you are invincible, I'll just tell you. But the reality is, it all ends with this carton given out and nobody knows when that is so we've got to have an answer we've got to have hope that we sang about a little bit ago and and, and the best life is unbroken fellowship in relationship with Jesus the lover of our soul have you thought about how you'll face your final moments oh oh, that's a happy thought pastor on, on Easter it's not a pleasant thought But what would it take for you to be able to, in your final moments, not to cower from death, but to face it? And maybe even with some excitement, and then with courage, that we would face death unafraid. Let me tell you how Jesus enables us to do that. He moves us out of a Saturday mentality. I, I can't, a Saturday state of mind is what I keep coming up with and I think of the Billy Joel song, A New York State of Mind. So, a Saturday state of mind. Got a Saturday state of mind into a Sunday state of mind. He will take us from Saturday where death has defeated life. That happened on Friday and was going on Saturday into a Sunday, the first day of the week where life has defeated death. And, and he moves us from the last day of death into the first day of eternal abundant life and it happens while we're on the planet in, in the gospel stories in this Easter story there's, there's one great story about Mary Magdalene and it's found in John 20 and, and we'll read starting in verse 11 and some of you identify with this we all should now Mary stood outside the tomb crying she's still grieving and as she wept, she, she, she bent over to look into the tomb. I saw two angels, and they were in white, seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head, that'd be this, yeah, and one at the foot. That's how we bury people today, facing east. And they asked her, woman, why are you crying? Angels are talking to her. Why are you crying? And she said, They've taken my Lord. I want you to pay attention to that word. They didn't say, they've taken my teacher. They've taken my best friend. They've taken my savior. They've taken my king. They've taken my Lord away. And I don't know where they have put him. I just pause. Mary Magdalene buried more than a friend that day. On that weekend, she buried the only person Whoever helped her, according to what we see in Scripture. We don't know a lot about her, and some people have made wild speculations about her. But look at this one sentence from Mark 16, verse 9. Now, when Jesus rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven demons. Oh no, the dude's going to talk about demons. No, it's real. But this is important. Why the number seven? Why were there seven? Why why wasn't there 19 or two? In scripture, the number seven suggests completion. And so Mary Magdalene was completely afflicted. We don't know what her affliction was. We don't know what afflicted her. It might have been some type of dependency, depression. But she was completely afflicted, whatever it was. 
people avoided her. And we tend to avoid people like that too, don't we? Don't raise your hand. But Jesus didn't, and Jesus still does not. He, he not only befriended her, he delivered her because he had the power to do so. And when she came to the tomb and found that the body was gone and that the stone was rolled away, it never occurred to her that Jesus was simply following through on what he had promised he would do. And she missed that miracle. She obviously, you know, she saw two angels, but didn't realize they were even angels, and she missed that too in her grief, in her Saturday frame of mind. There are times in life when despair is so deep and sadness is so thick and the walls are so high around us and around our heart that we feel like we just can't get out some of you experienced that with some regularity where you've experienced it and all of us have experienced it to some degree if we're honest and these are tough times in which we feel like the world's closing in on us and 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 we, we feel if anything bad is going to happen, it's going to happen to me. That, just, that begins to just implode on us. And if I'm, if I'm lucky, it's just bad luck. And, 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 and God could send a miracle after miracle when we're in that frame of mind, in that Saturday state of mind, and blessing after blessing, and, and, and it just doesn't work. We just don't get it. And we wonder, what does Jesus do during those times? I'm going to just talk real with some of you that struggle with some of this. What does Jesus do in those kind of times? Here's the answer. John 20, 14. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. But she did not realize that it was Jesus. And he asked her, Woman, why are you crying? You see what Jesus did? He didn't give up on Mary. And can I tell you today, he doesn't give up on you. Most of us might have given up. We think, well, look, I mean, there's angels sitting there and they're talking to you and the tomb is empty and it's like, duh, Mary, don't you get it? Have you ever been in that place with a friend? But Jesus didn't do that. The empty tomb and the angels didn't open her eyes. Jesus took matters into his own hands and he came and he spoke to her and he didn't tell her, get yourself together, girl. What is wrong with you? He didn't say, cowboy up, chick. He spoke to her with tenderness. Mary, why are you crying? It came to her like a gentle shepherd, because he is. Why would he do this? Because he's Jesus. And Jesus does that, whether you believe it or not. He is ever patient. He is ever caring. He's the heart of God. He's so patient with, with you and with me. The prophet Micah asked uh, this question, and I don't have this before you. You look this up on your own time. It's found in Micah 7. Micah asked the question, where is another God like you who pardons the sins of survivors among his people, who cannot stay angry with your people forever because you, O oh God, delight in showing mercy? Once again, you will have compassion on us. That's looking at the faithfulness of God. Micah 7, 18 and 19. Once again, Jesus will have compassion on you. If you're still breathing, guess what? Mercy and compassion is for you. I don't care how bad you've screwed up. Doesn't make any difference. The difference is, are we going to believe him? Not some good advice, but believe in what he's done. There's people here this morning passing through seasons of life in which there's great sadness, or maybe you just feel like you're in a valley, in a slump, and it's really hard. And maybe it's the economy, and maybe it's family issues, or whatever the issue is that's got you there. Maybe it's your health. Maybe it's your job, or maybe you don't have one. And at some point, we hit the valley, 
we tend to think God must really be mad at me. There are times I sit with people and I'll visit and I'll listen and this statement comes, God must really be mad at me and it's like, no, no, he is not. The Lord does not change. Therefore, O Jacob, you are not consumed, it says in the Old Testament. And that word Jacob, that name means you cheater, you liar. And God realizes who we are without him. And he says, I don't change. Therefore, you are not consumed. And that's a good thing. It's a good thing. God's not mad. We start feeling bad, though. We get in that little Saturday cycle that these disciples were in. And we think, if, if I really had it together, I could get out of this thing. I'm tired of feeling bad. And if I'm tired of feeling ga- bad, God must be tired of me feeling bad too. And he, he's probably just mad at me. And stories like this one are in the Bible, in the Old Testament and the New. And they let us know that's not the case. That's not the truth. And God wants to remind us that he is patient and he is long-suffering with his children. Let me say this. So we've got a right picture of God. He's also righteous and holy. And Jesus will be the judge one day. If we're still breathing and in this carton right now, mercy is for you. Hope is for you. Change and recovery is for you. Restoration is for you today. He's more patient with you than you are with you. He comes and he brings you the message that says Saturday has come. And it's here. It's today. But listen. Saturdays are always followed by Sundays. Am I wrong? What was yesterday? What's today? I rest my case. (laughs) Look at what happened again. Saturdays are always followed by Sundays. And as we read and even in Psalm, I don't have that one too. Psalm 30 verse 5, you know this passage. Weeping may go on all night, but joy comes with a new morning. Last day, first day. So be patient. God is patient. Be patient with yourself. Eventually, the season passes, and it's Sunday, the first day. When when Saturdays come, that Saturday state of mind, do what Mary did. Let's notice her words to the angel. Let's go back to this John account. She says in verse 13, they've taken my Lord away. And she just kept calling Jesus her Lord, her King. In tough times, Jesus remained her Lord. This is important, friends. Anybody, and we've seen it, we've experienced it. Anybody can call Jesus Lord on the good days. Oh, praise the Lord. How are you doing today? Oh, I'm blessed. It's a good day. Nothing's gone wrong yet. Sun's shining 65 degrees. Right? You know that. But she just kept calling him Lord. When we're moving through the Saturdays of life, it's not always easy to call Jesus Lord. But when we can continue to call Jesus Lord on the Saturdays, if you will, oh, how good it is when that first day, when that Sunday comes. Listen to the end of the story. Still in John, uh, latter part of 15. Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've put him, and I will go and I will get him. You hear her devotion to Jesus, her Lord? Did you catch what she just said? I don't think Mary could have done this. She was so devoted to Jesus that she wanted to get his body and bring it back. But also note, she still didn't get the point of what was going to happen on the third day. But her devotion was there. And Jesus was so touched by her devotion, I believe, that when you read 16, Jesus said to her, and there's no way I can say it probably like Jesus did, but Mary, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, teacher, not, oh, my third grade teacher. Oh, look, it's my third grade teacher. No, no, no. No, no. This is, the highest level. Rabboni was reserved for the teacher, like the king. She recognized when he said Mary. 
when she heard Jesus call her name, she knew who he was. Someday, out of this carton, we will hear Jesus call her name, or maybe while we're still in the carton, and someday in heaven, when you hear Jesus call your name, all the pain of earth will have been worth it. Someday, we'll talk about it. See if, if I'm not telling you the truth. When you hear Jesus call your name, we'll be able to say in that moment, when we're in his presence, whatever struggle it took, he didn't forget. He knew my name. He knows your name. And when I heard him call my name, it'll be, when, I, when that happens, it'll, everything will be worth it. It'll be worth it all, as the song says, because I know that God knows me. Listen, your heavenly father, your heavenly king knows you and he knows you by name and he doesn't just see humanity as a mass of people. I, I mean, this is one of the amazing things about God. He sees individuals that he has created uniquely in his image and sin messed it up. And he sees us as individuals. He knows your name. He sees you. And you call him Lord. He calls you by name with regularity. The Bible says, if we're willing to confess his name on earth, he will confess our name in heaven. Now listen, this is not a tagline. This is not an incantation. This is not a magic potion. This is confess his name, Jesus, the king. That means he's king of my life. And, and that means there's no negotiation with the king. We talked about this a couple weeks ago. When we come to a king, we lay down our sword and say, command me. When we confess him, his name, Jesus the king, he's not ashamed to confess us before the father because we believe this good news, this gospel, that the son of God, God himself came in flesh, walked among us, tempted in every way, yet without sin, went to a cross, a criminal's cross, in my place, in your place, in the place of all who live on the planet and breathe, to pay a price. He paid and did not owe because I owed. And if my faith is in this good news, I don't have to pay. He paid. I offer my entire life, though. It is a free gift, but he calls us. He says, if you're going to follow me, and we read this a few weeks ago, and then you're going to have to die to yourself and let me live in and through you. He calls you by name. He has moved the world. Through his resurrection, Jesus has moved the world into Sunday, into the first day of the week, and he wants you and he wants me to follow. And it's not Saturday anymore, the last day. It may be Saturday state of mind. It may be Saturday in your outlook. It may be Saturday in your emotions like these disciples. But actually, God has already flipped the calendar page provisionally. It's happened. And we can move out of the state of death and sin and move into the era of life and grace and hope. And that move took place 2,000 years ago and we can still access by faith this good news. And anyone, anyone, anyone who wants to follow God from that Saturday state of mind, that, that last day of a bad week into a Sunday of renewal and restoration and recovery can do so. And we believe that because there was a movement in the tomb. We talked about movements at the beginning, messianic movements, but there was a movement in the tomb containing Jesus on that Sunday morning, that first day of the week. And the eyes that had fallen shut on the cross opened beneath the shroud. And the hands that had fallen limp, crushed by nails, straightened, straightened, and they strengthened beneath the veil. And the lips that had grown quiet, I believe, on that were quiet on Saturday, they spread into a soft smile on Sunday because he knew he had accomplished the work that none of us could do. Because there's 
a lot to smile about. The penalty of sin, guilt and shame has been paid. It is finished. But to those who will repent, renounce, receive that forgiveness, oh, he wants to bring restoration. And he is not finished with me yet. I don't know about you. The requirements of the law are finished. The power of the Spirit and Christ in us, our hope of glory, is not finished. And he says, to all who will believe this good news and submit to me as king and love me like I love you and I, I'll give you that and you'll be transformed. And we'll look more like Jesus. And then love and joy and peace and patience and goodness and kindness and gentleness and faithfulness and self-control all of a sudden takes the place of sin and guilt and shame and addiction and dependency and all the stuff that we hate and that God died for. It's available. Jesus says way back in Mark 1, before he's even revealed all the stuff about himself, before we ever get to the last eight chapters of Mark, Jesus says the fullness of time has come. This is like Mark 1, 17. You can check it, see if I'm right. Fullness of time has come. The kingdom of God is available. It's at hand. It's near. Repent and believe the good news. And he not even completed it yet. It's finished. Fully good news. It's not religion. It's not just advice. Well, if you would just pray as often as I do, if you would just do this, if you would just do that. No. He's the king and came and did something right in history that changes our status forever. And now we lovingly get to pursue him and say, oh God, what do you want? What does is, what is your love letter say to me? What do you desire to speak? Speak, Lord. And give me the grace to obey. Or maybe I just need to take the step and obey. Whatever your position is on that, Jesus has not changed. He is the resurrected king. Let's just stop and pray. Lord Jesus, I'm grateful that death has been defanged and turned from a dead end street to the on ramp to our very best life. Lord, I thank you that you call us to begin to walk in this even now. Lord, that you want to reveal yourself and that we would walk in relationship. Lord, that as we repent, renounce, receive, and we have relationship with you, the King. Lord, I thank you that we don't have to live in a Saturday state of mind like the disciples found themselves in. That you've turned that sadness into a the first day beauty, the resurrection beauty, the beauty of Sunday stood up in the tomb, the beauty of Sunday stepped out into that Sunday morning dawn and told person after person, and you tell us today what we're hearing. Oh, it's Sunday, and I don't have to be afraid of the grave any longer. Resurrection and life has come through Jesus Christ. Lord, we're grateful for that. I don't have to live in the guilt anymore. My sins are forgiven. My death is defeated. It is Sunday, and that is good news, Lord. I thank you for that. I pray we'd get it today. Lord, my words won't do it. Only the revelation that comes by your spirit. Lord, it's like when you even talked to Mary that morning after Lazarus uh, was raised. Lord, that even before he was raised, you said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And, and everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Well, we believe that you are king. I want to follow you. Like, I want to be devoted like Mary. I want to call your name and hear you call my name, oh God. Lord, I pray that for every individual in this room today. Lord, may they choose to believe that your rule and reign, your kingdom is available for their hearts. That the heart has a throne in there, metaphorically. Lord, that we would choose to get off that throne and give you the place of rulership, the place that you deserve, the place that is yours, O oh God. Jesus, Jesus, come and be king of our hearts today, I pray in your name. Amen. For those who've trusted Christ for forgiveness for this relationship, we're going to come to the table. 
I'm going to ask those who are going to help us at the table. And since uh, there's not a lot of small children in here, we're going to do it because I think there's something important about getting up out of our seat. Jesus came and gave us everything, but the faith to get up and come. So today, in just a minute, I'm going to invite you. And so those who are going to man the, 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 uh, or woman the uh, tables, go ahead and come and uncover the elements. And, and I'm going to invite you to come here in just a minute. Again, when we take of the Lord's Supper, this is something that Jesus gave us. He gave us two things to remember him by. He didn't even give us Christmas, and we do a really good job with that. But he did give us baptism as a picture of life, death, burial, and resurrection. And he also gave us the elements of the bread and the cup that we can do regularly as a tangible picture of him being broken for us, poured out blood to forgive us, and we can rejoice. And we proclaim, when we proclaim his death, it says in, in Corinthians, we proclaim it until he comes. We're making a proclamation when we come and take of these elements. So it's reflective, it's somber, and yet there's a celebration aspect of this. So this morning, I'm gonna invite you to come. The worship team is gonna sing a, a very powerful song I want you to come prayerfully. Ask God to just reveal this Sunday hope, this first day hope in your heart. And we'll take, if you'll come down the outside rows, if we're, I, I noticed in the first service, if we stay out to the edges and leave room for people to kind of do passing lanes, but mainly if we come down and come back up this way, some will want to come back and take their spot. So that was probably clear as mud. <laughs> Don't lose, Jesus has risen. Okay. So, Father, I just thank you. You held nothing back. And Lord, we just want to come now. We just offer ourselves as living sacrifices to you as we come and receive the bread and the cup in Jesus' name. We'll hold them and we'll take them together in just a few moments. So if you'll come get the elements, take them back to your seat, we'll take them together.
We have our moments where we fall into that Saturday state of mind and they happen not as we choose but we do get to choose who we're going to focus on the king who's overcome death guilt shame sin it's a daily choice you call people to commit their lives to Jesus but it's not a one time deal if you think you're getting on a one time deal somebody sold you a bad bill of goods this is the gospel, the good news of the king who's come to establish relationship through his body and his blood. Not a religious deal. It's a walk of power. It's a walk of transformation. It's a relational connect. The one who created us, made us in his image that sin obscured and made a mess of. Jesus at the Passover he just took the meal with him that celebrated coming out of slavery to a physical entity Egypt that represented the world system what I think and what I feel and what I want and, and they sacrificed the lamb and, and, they, and they ate that one lamb for every family so that the wrath of God would be appeased sacrifices were made over and over so that sin would be covered we just sang the truth he came to erase sin not just cover it momentarily it says that Jesus has taken it upon himself my sin, your sin so that night at the table they'd eaten the Passover meal they'd already had two cups of symbolic wine I'm not talking, they weren't chugging stuff they had little cups and after supper he picked up some of the unleavened bread this is what even now they use to celebrate the Passover it's unleavened bread if you notice from a distance it's pierced and it's striped reminding us of Jesus our Passover lamb the one who was broken for us today we remember what Jesus did was he was there with his disciples on the night he was betrayed, he picked up bread off the table. He gave thanks to the Father and then he broke it. And he said, this is my body given for you. It hadn't happened yet. He's symbolically telling them, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat. And as often as you do this, remember me. Remember, it's all about him. Let's take and eat to the glory of God.
Jesus, we thank you for your sacrifice, that you were scourged, that you took the punishment that we deserve, and you took it upon yourself. Your body was pierced and broken for us. But Lord, you empower us now by your grace and your Holy Spirit to be your body on the planet, to be your hands and feet, to be broken for those around us. Not that we can go around breaking other people, but Lord, you've called us to be your body. And we thank you for the privilege in your name. In the same way, after supper, he took the third cup. There was a fourth cup, but they didn't even drink that. That was symbolic of when we would drink it in heaven. But he took the third cup and they, they knew what it meant. It was the cup of redemption being bought back. That's what they celebrated that they were purchased out of slavery from Egypt. And Jesus says to them, he picks up that cup of redemption and he says, this is the new covenant in my blood. As often as you drink it, do it in remembrance. We remember the one who has set us free from sin, guilt, and shame because he cut a covenant with us in his own blood. Take and drink in remembrance of our king. Father, you made it so. It's part of the justice that there is no forgiveness of sin without the shedding of blood. And we are grateful that we live in the day that we celebrate you, the Lamb of God, Jesus, who came to be the perfect sacrifice, one Lamb for all who would come by faith. So Jesus, we give you thanks this morning for forgiveness of sin through the shedding of blood. Amen. I'm going to ask you to stand with me as we conclude. And if you'll pass those cups out, there are going to be willing, uh, smiling faces who will take those from you. Remember, Easter says you can put truth in a grave, but it won't stay there. The old history ends with the cross. Our new history begins with the resurrection. So let's make this proclamation that in this song as we prepare to leave that Jesus is risen. We have newness of life and forgiveness of sin in that. Let's make this proclamation. call your name and may you regularly call his name it's so good to be with you today and coming to church doesn't make us more acceptable 
But it helps us when we gather to honor his name and to look to him in worship corporately. It, it helps us just like the disciples. We have our Saturdays. And it's good to gather on the first day to be reminded of who's king, who won the battle, and whose victory we live in, and who are we following. I need that encouragement. And I would welcome you back if this is maybe the first time you've been here or maybe the first time in a while. Come be with us on a regular basis. Let's encourage one another, pray for one another. And now may the God of peace who brought up again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you today with everything good that you may do his will working in you, working in us, working in me, that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever and ever and ever and after all the forevers. Amen. If you have any questions about walking with Jesus, I would love to visit with you. Matter of fact, I've got gifts back here if you... Uh, uh, want, so if you're a newcomer and you filled out the thing, I'd love to just see you. So, bless you.